got it. All right, I started recording. Did I give up? Did we have a long time? Jesse was on the hat. It thinks it's four by three, but it's not actually four by three. That's Jesse was on the hat. Is this a common problem? Dude, that'd be a great chance. It's okay. One day I'll be able to tell them apart by voice. Yeah, no. Jesse's like voice is more like. They're not trying to get this thing. Jesse's voice has like more hope in it, and he's just like I'm dead on the inside. Wow. Wow. This is savage. Weird. Okay. So I can't change the aspect ratio. I don't know. Where what happened to all the left room soda? Where did the soda go? I can't even find myself alone in my bedroom. I don't even think we have. We've had it for a while. Okay, how do you spell your last like name? Bottles of left room. Whitlock. W H I T L O C K. Um. Yeah. Bottles of left room soda. This is kind of, is there a way to change the aspect ratio on this? Shit, yes. Right. No, it doesn't get better, though. It only gets worse. <laughs> that, that doesn't I still okay. it. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Like, I'm running at 10, 24, <laughs> 768. That's pretty bad. Uh, Does someone have to press the menu button? And we go to... Uh, no, not when you can have What do you need? Not even one for myself. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was like, oh, I can get the soda, and then... Oh, well. I, I was water. so close. <gasps> Just I need to be my, my, my angel yeah. today. There you go. Intuitive angel. design. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can send a quarter page for cash. <laughs> Jesse, if you're oh. an angel, you demand 50% ownership. Jesse's an angel today. Is that what you want? No. That's not worse. <laughs> How much trouble can I make him? I need an adult. Did that do anything? <laughs> no, I am an adult. It did not. <laughs> God. Oh, wow. There's okay. other functions. <laughs> Jesse, you need to demand 50% ownership of his business. Mm. This projector's not good. Mm. No, it is return. <laughs> no, it's just the menu. Oh, there we go. Uh, well, I guess we can't. Whatever. That works. Whatever. Okay, so text is going to be slightly like pulled, but it's sort of stretched. Look at that number in the lower right hand corner. Oh. Because of my mouse, the scroll wheel is what can do things, and the scroll wheel is kind of old, so it moves a lot. Like that. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> this is problematic. There we go. Is this recording? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Uh, okay, so, hi. Hi. Um, hi. I'm going to be giving a talk on a... Uh, testing library that I wrote um, and how it works and sort of how things work under the hood and why I wrote it and what it means. Um, so yeah, this is quite subtitled How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love C++ Templates because they're kind of crazy. Okay, so I'm Catherine Whitlock. Um, some of you guys might know me as the girl who's always talking about Phil Campbell, but really I'm the one who always sits over in the corner on the couch all the time. So today I'm going to be talking to you about the joys of testing and C++ and more importantly the joys of testing with C++ but really the lack of joy testing with C++. Okay so you guys probably have taken intro to SE um, I'm guessing and in that class they talk about testing and they walk you through doing some tests I think with unit testing and C and doing like just standard asserts, that sort of thing. Um, and you sort of get an idea about how testing works. And then when you go to 261, you start getting more into testing about how you develop a specification and then you develop your application and you write tests to go with that application. Um, and that's sort of how a testing model works. Uh, there's this thing called test-driven development. And the thing about test-driven development is instead of writing your tests during the the development phase of your application, you instead start off writing your tests, and then you write your application so that it conforms to the tests, and it will pass them. And then you do this cycle of refactoring so that your code passes your tests, and then you may develop more tests for another feature, and then you get those to pass, and then you keep going. And then there's behavioral driven development. And BDD is a different sort of paradigm based on test-driven development, and what it focuses on is actually modeling the specifications themselves. So instead of writing unit tests where you're like asserting that 
one thing equals the other. BDD is more focused on representing tests in a human way, like a human readable way, so that they match specifications that you can easily print out and show to other people. So these are some of the frameworks that people use for BDD testing. Um, you guys have probably heard of RSpec and Cucumber, and I don't know if many people have heard of JBehave, but it's kind of the old one. It was the first one, really. And then ja JavaScript has Jasmine, which came after RSpec, and I think RSpec came out like 2006, 2005 maybe? Um, and it was written by the guy who wrote JBehave because he was working on Ruby and then wanted something to test with. So, RSpec is considered the BDD specification testing framework, and it's for good reason. It's very mature, it has this great syntax because Ruby is really flexible in how it can work with a domain-specific language. You, it, it allows you to define your own keywords and just work with them. And it's really readable. Like, there aren't parentheses, and a, like, a lot of things <coughs> have normal curly braces, like some places, but not a lot. So it's pretty simple. Jasmine is our spec for JavaScript, but due to ja how JavaScript actually functions with anonymous functions and things like that, and the syntax is a little bit stricter, it had to be adapted so that it fit more of a JavaScript syntax model. And so they're passing around lambdas here into a function in order to build the test itself. That direction. Okay, so the thing about these two languages is that they're dynamic. And that's really important. The thing about dynamic languages is that you can do a lot of things at the runtime that you wouldn't normally be able to do. For instance, you can put a method that will actually test and see if another function runs on an object in the middle of it. So if you have a method that is attached to an object, you can inject a function between those two to see if it works. Or you can look inside the actual object in the, like the private variables and stuff like that that you're not normally supposed to see. Stuff like that. C++, on the other hand, is a static language. And what that means is you can't really do a lot of that runtime stuff. It's very strict in how it works. A lot of the stuff is done at compile time. It also has what's known as a static type system. And the thing about a static type system is that all of your types are determined when you're compiling. So in Ruby, you can actually define a class in your application while it's running, and then create objects from that class, and then add fields and stuff as you're running. And that's one of the really powerful things about dynamic languages. C++ doesn't let you do it. And so if you don't have your types at compile time, it'll just fail and you'll get a mass of compiler errors that you guys have probably all seen. So C++ aren't really good for writing DSLs because of that. They have this really strict syntax of like function, open, close, brace, parentheses and places. And like, it's not really de designed to be able to be adapted very easily to doing something different with it. And so because of that, you really only have two options. You can work, either work with C++'s preprocessor, which uses the hash include or hash define macros, that sort of stuff, in order to do text replacement. So if like you define uh, int, capital int, or actually false, I think, in and C is actually defined as zero. So you define false as zero is actually one of the things that's a macro. And it just does a text replacement, basically copy and paste wherever there's false. Or you could go even further, um, which is actually writing an application that runs before your thing gets compiled and goes over the source files that you have and changes them so that they're actually valid C++ or C. And that's how Flex and Bison, which have their own syntax for writing C-like, programs, or the original C++ compiler back in the 60s it was actually a program that ran over a source file and emitted C that then got compiled. So we have something like this um, in Jasmine, which is going to be a little bit easier to see because it's more of a C-style syntax, so we can sort of adapt to that. And we're trying to get it to look in a language that works like this. <laughs> you guys might... It's Java-ish. You can see there's like weird parentheses and colons and namespaces and stuff. So yeah. Um, so let's just take a step back. I like testing. Like testing is really interesting to me because it asserts that your program is it's running the way you want it to. I mean, obviously you don't always have tests that cover every case, and that's where you have bugs oftentimes. And so if you find a bug, you write a test to cover that bug, and you 
make sure you don't ever have a regression. Um, and that's kind of important because testing for me is a big deal. I like RSpec for testing. I actually learned testing with RSpec on Rails application that I was working along with Kristen and Yingling. And so RSpec was really my first introduction to testing. And because of that, I got kind of addicted to how it works and the syntax of it and how simple it seemed to be. Because you just write stuff in like, what seemed to be human language, and then it would do all these fancy things that would run all your tests, and it would just do like it, it would just make sure that everything worked. And I kind of like C++ too. Um, yeah, I know, right? Horror, <laughs> surprise. Um, and so about two years ago, I wanted to start a C++ project, like an actual one. I have little tiny ones before that, uh, but I wanted to start a C++ project for real. And I decided I was going to start out with some sort of TDDPD system. And so I went looking for an RSpec-like framework for C++. And you'd think in maybe a language of millions that there would be something like that. Uh, there was really nothing. So I got a little upset. <laughs> and I really didn't like that. So I went around looking at what sort of testing frameworks did exist for C and C++. And you really only have these. Um, you got some for unit testing. Um, you might notice boost.test. Boost is a huge framework, and not many people like including it in a lot of applications unless they're already huge. Um, but you have other things that sort of work in. And then you have these, the BDD testing frameworks, like Catch, Google Test. Um, and that's really what I looked at. Catch looks like this. Catch is actually relatively new, and it's considered good in terms of how it works. Um, it's sort of BDD, you can tell because it uses factorial here, and so that's like your scope, and then you actually have your, your specification where you put your tests inside, and it sort of makes sense. Google test looks like this, and that's actually the same program as the one before, just in a different syntax. And they have, instead of the equal equals, they actually have parameters that they put into their macro which then gets transformed into the test that gets run at runtime. Um, C-spec is actually developed for C, not C++, but it still works. Um, it sort of has a more R-spec-ish syntax, but it's still all macros, and you have to use weird stuff like end, which isn't idiomatic C at all. Um, and I, that, yeah. <laughs> and then there's Igloo. And Igloo is considered like, about as close to BDD as you can get in C++ up until now. And what it's describing is you have an object called describe, and it builds this object using macros, and you have functions inside those macros, and it looks for these classes and objects and builds them and then tries and runs your test. It feels kind of weird. So we, we sort of have things that look like this. They're kind of more like unit tests than what we saw in Jasmine and RSpec. And we really want something like this, not like require stir comp equals equals one. Because pretty code. So what do you guys think of this? <laughs> yeah, that's actual C++. Okay, so let's see that again. There's this, and then there's this. Not much changing, huh? So yes, I made our spec for C++. It's like an actual thing, and it actually works. <laughs> Why? So even cooler is that these are the only macros in the entire world. There's about 13 of them, and they're just, just the keywords. Um, and I don't really expect you to use words like this in a test to, for variables, so I don't really think that's a problem. You could just undefine them and then use something else, but I don't really see why you'd want to. But that's all there is. So when you expand the macros, you really only add self here and some weird stuff that we're going to be talking about that looks kind of strange. And then, yeah. So how the hell does this work? Because it looks like <laughs> black magic. And it really is. <laughs> but seriously, it's, we're using templates all over the place. And some extra things, too. Um, I have an object generator pattern, which is actually used just in C++, really. And that's used for determining the type of things in templates. Because normally, when you create an instance of a class, you actually have to define what all the classes inside of it are using. But if you use a function, it can automatically determine what those types are. 
And so that's called the object generator pattern. Um, the visitor pattern is used for actually executing the tests and then printing them out, because whenever we run a test, we want to print it to the formatter, so the formatter gets passed along the tree as we're running the tests. And really, all of what those syntax extensions are is just methods on objects, and that's the really cool thing. And we also have lambdas, and lambdas for days. And lambdas let you do things like this. You have a, some sort of vector, a list, and then you have this function, what, accumulator, and you're passing it into something, maybe? And we don't know. OK, so yeah, C++ is actually semi-functional now, which is really, really weird. And it has automatic type deduction. And if you actually like looked, there's no return type here, but it's still returning an int, which is pretty weird. So with anonymous functions, with lambdas, we can have this in JavaScript, which then goes to this in C++11, and then this in C++14. Isn't that cool? I think that's pretty cool. Wow. <laughs> Mind blown. So all of these things that were pretty much impossible before with doing like passing by like function itself to another object, it's actually possible now. And so we have something that we can do like this. And didn't we see something like that before? And oh yeah, look, it's Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> so we've sort of resolved that whole problem of passing functions to another, like, another function. And the biggest problem now is that we can't really add the tests to the thing that runs the tests, because we have to modify that object except that object is around the function that we're trying to use the tests in. So how do we do that? And the answer is use a variable. And if you can't do that, use more variables. Um, really, you're actually passing around the object that it's wrapping into the function itself. Um, usually C++ has a this keyword to use to the actual object when you're writing a method. So like, I think Java has something. What does this. Java have? This. Oh, it does use this. Okay. Um, so Java also has this. Um, in C++ though, this is a pointer, which is a little bit strange, but you get used to it. So instead I use self, which is rubies, but it just makes sense. Self and this are pretty close. So you have this, one, like if you're on a global scope, like if you're defining a global object, you would use this, and then once you're inside a function, a local scope, you can use this, which actually captures all of the variables that you've already defined in the function before you create this crazy thing and then use it. We can do things like this then. So you define some variable, and then you create a function, a lambda, and then <laughs> you add some value. But out here, nothing is still zero, which is the really important thing, because you're hygienic then. You aren't changing things outside of your scope, but you can still change them inside of here. If you don't use that immutable keyword, everything inside of here is const, which means you can't modify it. It's just there. So now we've got this. We, this global scope, this local scope, because it's inside of another function that wraps. And it's all starting to sort of make sense and look like something normal. But how does this work? Because expect is supposed to take more than just a string or an int or anything. It's supposed to take everything. And everybody knows that C functions can't really do that because they take things like car star word and return ints. But no, not really. Um, this is where templates come in. And templates are basically like Java generics, except they're a lot more powerful. They're Turing complete. Um, somebody wrote a Turing machine that runs at compile time using macro, like C++ templates, which is a bit I don't know why they had that much time on their hands, but they did it. <laughs> so, yeah. Here's a function that does something on ints. We're just adding two numbers. It's pretty normal. You can probably write that in C pretty easily. Except, here's one that works on anything now. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so, how? Uh, it's this, this magical <coughs> keyword sort of block thing. Um, it literally means out of all of the types that we can possibly have, we're going to use some type and we're going to call it T. 
but we don't know what that type is yet, so we're just going to use it as a placeholder. And so then when we do this and we call it with an int, C++ is like, oh, you called it with an int, so clearly t has to be an int everywhere you use t. And it does this at compile time, and it's called template substitution. So cool story. <laughs> you want to see some of the crazy things you can do with this? Maybe? Yeah. OK, of course you do. <laughs> this is actually inside the library. Um, this is a function, a method, which is inside of a class that is templated over an A, and a function that is templated over an M. And so we sort of have a matcher that is the M, and an expectation, which is templated over the A. And it takes a message in a matcher. And then at compile time, we check that a matcher base with an A and an M expected T is the parent class of M. And then we run the actual thing. But the powerful thing is that this is at compile time. If this fails, the, the whole program won't compile. And so you're actually checking the types and doing these tests before they even can fail in your program. And then we run the match. Um, this is a bit more crazy, and I broke this. Uh, this tests if your object can be iterable. Um, basically, in C++, a iterable object is one that has begin and end, or const begin, const end. And if it doesn't have that, we return false. But if it does, we return true. Um, and the crazy thing about this is it's done at compile time because true type is the type of true and false type is the type of false. And they're actually instantiations of an integral class, which is just weird. I don't really know why. But then we build a class called iterable that is templated over T and it tests that template. And so whenever we call is iterable, and we put in brackets here, and we put in like, I don't know, list int, and then say colon colon value, because it inherits from these, it'll actually return true or false at compile time, whether it has those methods. And so we can actually say, oh, is this something I can iterate over? And if it is, run an iterator over it. Or we can check and see if it's actually even better, like a map which has keys and values, and we can then change how we iterate and iterate over it that way. And that's really, really powerful because you're determining that at compile time and the, the compiler can actually optimize away the pieces that you're not using. So it's all magic. <laughs> yeah. So for something like this, which is our test, it really goes to something like this where expect is a, holds a standard string and starts with is comparing a standard string to a standard string. That's not that hard to understand, right? pretty easy, makes sense. So yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, and since these are our macros, we just replace them. And suddenly we have a test that looks like Jasmine and is beautiful and pretty. Um, so we've got our test and how do we run it? We have that description it expectation thing. Um, this is really where the difference between a framework and a library works. Because in America, you run tests, but in Soviet Russia, the tests run you. <laughs> Replacing America within a library and Russia within a framework. When you define an RSpec test, RSpec is actually the one that figures out you wrote that test. It actually goes through all of the Ruby files, finds the test. It's like, oh, you have a test, and adds it to a list of tests. And then when you want to, it runs the tests automatically. You can even run RSpec, the command RSpec, from the command line, and it will find all of your tests and run them which is pretty crazy. So RSpec is actually doing the running for you. It's doing all of the things that you need to determine. With a library, it's a little bit different. Instead of having it done for you, you instead add them manually. So for instance, we, get, we create a runner here, a runner object. And we add a specification, hello world spec. And then we execute the runner, and we return exit if it was true, and failure if it was false. And by doing that, we suddenly have a program that either is 0, which is a good value when you print out the bash, or a 1 value, which is an error when you're in bash. And you can determine whether your tests fail or pass. You can even run individual tests, which is really nice, because if you want to just test one test instead of a set of tests, you can just test that test by using run, 
with a formatter and returning whether it succeeds or fails. Or you can even just test an expectation because it also has a, a run on it. Because these are all just visitor classes. They all have a run method. I don't really know why you'd want to do this though because the whole point of this is that you don't have to do this at all. <laughs> so this really gives you a lot more control over your tests and which ones are enabled, disabled, and how they're printed out at any level. Like you can actually have printers be different between files so that one's verbose and one is printing out like tap, which I'll show you guys, and everything else. So it's not really a black box because the API is exposed to you. You actually work with it yourself instead of having it work automatically for you. So what's so special about all of this? Why did you actually write this and why is it cool and why should people use it? Well, it's designed because <coughs> I wanted it to be special. I want it to be used in production environments. And so like a lot of other testing frameworks, it's header only, which means you literally just do an include and you have everything. It's cross-platform, I'm already testing it across Windows, Clang, C++, or GCC, excuse me, GC, G++. And it runs on FreeBSD, runs on Windows, runs on Mac, runs on Linux. So we already have that covered. It's really, really fast. I don't do any heap allocation, which actually saves me a lot of time because suddenly everything's on the stack and everything goes blazing. Releases are a single header file. Um, I actually wrote a tool specifically to do this. It goes through all of the files in the library and combines together all of the header files. So you get a 3,000 line header file and you just stick it in your spec folder and then you can include it in any of your specs and just forget about it. Um, and the nice thing about that is that you can hold a release. So if you were using like version 1.2 and you don't want to automatically go to 1.3 or 1.4, you can just keep the file there and update it when you want to. Um, if your project is working like a library, a static library or a shared library or anything like that, which it should be if you're developing a big program because you're linking a front end to the actual things doing things, you don't have to actually recompile the tests. You just relink them. And that's a big deal. Templates take a long time to compile, like a really long time, because the compiler has to look at the template, figure out what's going on, replace everything, add more templates, and combine everything together and actually compile it. And it does a lot of abstract syntax tree manipulation, which takes a long time. Um, we already support multiple output forms, like I've said, verbose, progress, tap. Progress is a bunch of dots, verbose, prints out like our spec, which I'll show you, it's pretty. And tap is actually a Perl um, thing that Wesley told me about. I don't really know why it's like it is, and I had to actually do some finagling to get it working, but it does now. Um, and then you also have what's probably the coolest feature so far, is you can make your own custom matcher object for like, if you're using something that you need custom matchers for. You literally just have to inherit from base matcher and then define a match method, and that's it. And then you can just give an object, give the class actually, an instantiation to dot two, which I showed you before, that templated function, and it'll run the matcher. So I guess I can show you guys an example now because it's all kind of getting long. I'm just running a terminal and actually open the flag and then go full screen. Okay, so code, CPP, CPP, yeah. Okay, so I made an example spec. Um, oh, wow. So here's an example spec. Um, you can see the basic structure. You're just including CPP spec, and then you're creating a description, and then you have a description inside of a description, which is called an explanation. And then we're using the special keyword called let, which I haven't yet talked about, but I'll talk about here. What let does is it creates a variable inside of this area, but this variable is memoized whenever you do an it. 
So whenever you call count, it's not actually changing, it's not doing plus plus count, it's only doing it once in here. And so it gets not, it, but it's not cached across examples, which is the important thing. Um, this is a explanation for a standard list, and this is actually one of the really cool things that I managed to do. Um, I created something that could be templated over another ob class or object. And so you can say, okay, I want this initializer list, which is actually a different type in C++, to be a standard list of ints instead of just an initializer list or a vector. And it actually, if there isn't one of these, it'll create, it'll actually call the default constructor for you. And doing this, you have a, uh, let's see, it doesn't have it, it's down there, okay. There's a special keyword called subject, I don't actually see it. Um, but there's a special keyword called subject that refers to this object. And so you can say like expect subject dot to have two, for example, and it'll check that and actually base it on that. Um, so yeah, this is some of the stuff. We have a bunch of matchers to contain, so it makes sense that it is expected to contain 312, which 312. You can expect this, the explicit thing, to actually start with one. You can say, okay, I want this object that we're creating to contain four, and we want to make sure that it doesn't have four, five, six. And yeah. Why are we defining a type for explain? Uh, why does that need to be there? Because it casts the initializer list to that type. Okay. Because initializer list works for vectors, uh, I think pair, <coughs> uh, list, forward list, queue, deck, a bunch of different stuff. Um, and so instead of take, like creating an instance of initializer list, which is what it would do if we didn't create, like de define what it was, mm -hmm. um, it's taking that definitely. Um, we have to create it to be templated because we have to know what this type is. Oh, because there's implicit references to it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's, for example, a pretty powerful example of what's going on. And then we create our runner down here and we add a spec and we execute it. So one of the things you might notice is some of these don't have the strings that we normally have. We this has start with one, but this doesn't have anything. And how is it supposed to print out things if we don't know what it is, really? And it's sort of more magic. Um, so if I do clang and actually compile this. This is what I was talking about it taking a long time. That took like a second, which is a long time for a single file. And then run it. It looks like that. And the things that we did not tell it actually get printed out. It builds the words based on what was defined in the matcher and can automatically print out everything. Yeah. What did you think about that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I wrote RSpec for C++ and it, and it freaking works, guys! <laughs> it's kind of awesome and I'm really, really happy about this because I started this project two years ago and I was like, oh, this really isn't going to go anywhere. I'll just look at RSpec source and try and make it into C++ and see if I can do this. And it kind of stopped after about a month and I was like, eh, okay. And then I wanted to start a C project. I'm building a garbage collector in C. And I wanted to create tests for that before I actually started the garbage collector so I could determine what's going on. Because a garbage collector, that's kind of important and you need your test for it. And so I went back to this project and I was like, oh, I'd really like to use this, but I don't have any of the things I really want and there's no implicit its and no subjects and no lets and anything like that, so I need more. And so I made all of it work properly. Um, in fact, there's even more stuff inside there. If I go to... Samples. Yeah. Uh, this is actually ripped out of the Jasmine intro. This is a direct one to one translation of Jasmine to C P spec. Um, and we're literally just defining tests and it, expectations, more local variables, defining false. You can pass in a function to 
something and it'll test that function against a value. You can even pass in functions to the matchers themselves and show, I, I don't think I have an example of that, but I might, pi e no pointer. Yeah, oh no, that's before all. It's not in here. This is a lot bigger. So the other thing about this is I'm writing the test in itself. The problem with that is that it takes a really long time to compile. Because whenever I want to run a spec, it has to compile against itself. So unlike what I was telling you before about how you can just run linkages against other programs, this is header only, and so it has to look at the templates every time it wants to compile. So it takes a good five seconds to compile every time. It's probably going to take longer when I build more tests. Kind of annoying, but whatever. Oh, the, here, you can see the custom matcher stuff that I was talking about. So we have a custom matcher, and it's a subclass of a matcher, and we define a match, which is just doing equals equals and on the expected value and the actual value. And then we're passing our custom matcher in here, and it compares two to two, and it passes. So you can easily create custom matchers. <coughs> uh, I'm trying to remember because I was working on this and I think it was on something that had, uh, I want to say, no, that is a nickel, obviously. Uh, this is weird. Oh, JK, it's here. Yeah, there we go. So you can pass in a lambda to an expectation, and then it will, this is to fail. And so it expects this test to actually fail, and will return the test passing if the test inside of it fails. A little bit meta. Um, some of the other crazy stuff that you can do is you can actually test to see if something throws something else. I think I have an example of that in here. Oh no, it's in the Jasmine example. So we're creating a function, and that function throws an exception, and then we're making sure it throws that exception. And you're like, why does that really, why is that so crazy? And the reason is, is that it's passing the function into here, saving the function for later, and only calling it when we actually call the masher. And it's also implicitly figuring out what type of exception it is. <laughs> you can obviously say that it's a custom type of exception, but it's figuring out that it's a standard exception here. Yeah, basically, templates, man. They're kind of really, really crazy. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of it. Do you guys have any questions? Because I have, yeah, go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you're saying that due to it being um, a lot of templates, compiling is really slow. Would, um, would you get much of a benefit out of pre-compiled headers for this? So, good question. I can actually <laughs> show you. Answer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Build. Uh, make clean. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. You see this thing called Cotire? Cotire is a thing that precompiles headers that you use everywhere so that it can save the AST transformation and just use it everywhere else. You'd expect it to be a bit faster, except. Oh. <laughs> well, that's new. <laughs> well, I, okay, well I have an extra closing brace somewhere that I probably edited when I was editing this earlier. I can just show you guys the Jasmine one then. Yeah. Oh. Nope. <laughs> okay. This is a master base, so I'll just go in there and actually edit it. Include live cut expectations of the learner. Oh, yeah, okay. 
doi. <laughs> it's because I removed the expectations namespace and I didn't remove the closing brace for it there. Oh look, it's taking forever. <laughs> and you saw how simple these things were. They were only like four functions and it took like five seconds total to build the entire thing. Yeah. So yeah, free compiled headers don't actually do much for it, unfortunately. I wish it did, but that's why I, like, I'm focusing so much on the ability to link again, because that means that you can have a test, you can have your source, and you can define your test and be sure that your test is right, but then it fails the test and you just have to edit the source and rebuild the source itself, and then the test links again so you can run the test again. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take that long compile time. And that's pretty important. Wesley. So when you're testing a testing framework, how do you guarantee negative functionality? Negative functionality? Yeah. Like, how do you guarantee that your failures actually fail? I, I have a to fail thing. Yeah, but how do you check whether your to fail is failing? Oh, I had to do that manually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a fun time. That took about four hours. I couldn't figure out how to get it working properly. I ended up creating a result object, and a result returns a success or a failure. Um, and it, the, the result can actually be casted to a bool, and that's what happens when you run, because a run returns a result, but it's implicitly casted to a bool when you're returning it from your main function. Um, and so by doing that, we can say whether this is a failure or a success. The other way that we do it is in here, include child. Um, so this is, yeah, a lot of documentation. I do, I do document things, but <laughs> this is a child object so that we have some, every class inherits child, so in some describe in the child of nothing, but the its are just childs of the describe, and the expectations are childs of the describe, and the matches are childs of the expect, which makes sense. And the way that it actually checks and sees if things work out properly is we have this get status, there we go. It returns the status, which is a field up here, which is a boolean. And what happens is when you tell the child that it failed, yeah, there we go. It sets the thing to a failure, and then if it has a parent, it tells the parent that it failed too. And so everybody fails. <laughs> and it just goes wrong. Yeah, but that's how we actually propagate the failure up the tree, and so we figure out that the entire test set failed, and that's how we return it outside. Um, but yeah, resulting in testing failure was a little pr complex. I didn't have an ignore function there, so when I did the failure, I was actually testing if the, fail the thing inside the failure was also failing. It got a little meta. <laughs> okay, so that's that. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm Wesley. Some preference question. Uh, I see that your uh, chain for not is not underscore parentheses. Yeah, why? Yeah, why, why are you Because not as a keyword. Why, why is it a function and not a, uh, just a, an object with more methods on it? Recursion. <laughs> so the problem is when you try to instantiate something at compile, like when you're instantiating your object that is a variable, and it holds an inverted version of itself, it keeps creating more objects. So, <laughs> lazy instantiation. No. Oh. <laughs> so, I, yeah, it's a function, which makes sense to me. I mean, Jasmine, I think, has it as a, as a property, but Jasmine's JavaScript, and they do weird stuff anyways. Also, to also be in really any English word you can think of. Yeah. Oh, if you guys want to see how many matches I have, I can just do that. These are some of them. These aren't even all that many. So to be true, to be falsy, to be truthy, to be less than, to be matched, to partial, to fail with, to fail, to contain, to be between, to start with, to end with, to equal, and then to on a custom masher, and to be null, and to satisfy, which takes a block and runs your own test. So yeah, we have a lot right now. And I'm adding more, because I want to try and have everything that Jasmine has in the extras. Um, and so far it's going pretty well, because the actual things are not all that hard to define. Um, let's go with start with, because I just made that recently. So this is a start with, and start with either takes, takes a thing that is iterable, so 
that thing I was talking about, how it takes an E and it asserts that it's iterable, and match can only assert, it can only test against things that are iterable because of how it actually matches. And the match function takes an actual, takes an expected, and then it compares their equality using the begin and end iterable functions and starting and begin. So that's all you need to do. It's like, I don't know, 70 lines of code, which is ridiculously simple for a matcher that does something like testing whether something starts with something else. I thought I was going to have to implement this manually, and then I found out that C++ does stuff for you. I went online looking at Stack Overflow, and they were like, oh yeah, use this 50 line function. I was like, what? <laughs> and then I went on like C++ Reference, which is actually a really nice website now. Um, and I found this equal function, and it was like, yeah, if you want to test reverse, you just use the reverse iterator. And that works too. I was like, great. So yeah. Um, any other questions? I don't know. Yeah. Just because I'm curious, since you've worked a lot of compilers, which ones are handling template compilation time the best? Like GCC, Clang, and uh, oh. MSVCC? MSVCC is the slowest. Mm. Um, and I think that's actually because it has a lot of featured enabled by default that mm -hmm. probably it doesn't need. Um, whereas with this, I'm only adding the flags dash standard equals C++14, dash w all, dash w error, so that it fails on all and fails on the, error, and the errors. Um, and that's another thing, actually, is your entire project doesn't have to be compiled with the C++14 standard flag, just the tests themselves, which is really important, because some people have custom build settings for their projects that are really, really important and they can't mess around with them like that. And so you just have to make sure that your tests are the things that only do that. Mm -hmm. And your project is actually already passing all the other stuff. Yeah. Cool. You guys like it? I have a website. <laughs> Shameless plug. Shameless plug. I have a website. It shows you things. <laughs> Whoa. It even shows you things like how it actually works. Yeah, here's a failure. So stuff like that, that's a failure, um, which is crazy. How do I get an automated test that verifies that my failure is printing red? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to deal with like checking O streams, okay? That's gross. Don't ask me about that. Though, <laughs> results contain a string that has the failure message, and you can probably just check that. <laughs> Because I have dot to fail with. Anyways, uh, so I just have a question. What's going on with the indentation there for expected one, two, three to include six? Why is it like left indent? Like uh, the, the second failure? No, so, like there, expected one, two, three to include six? It's so that it can be easily seen as a failure. I know it's red here, but if you print it out without color, mm -hmm. it's hard to see that this is a failure. And printing out the failure here instead of indented is easier to tell that it was an actual failure instead of just a normal thing that passed. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's the error message for the error above it? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That, I guess that makes sort of sense. So yeah. All right. I made a thing. It's cool. You guys should tell other people. <laughs> yeah, you and stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Hey.